Alrighty. And we are live at Book Chat Book Club with Nancy Campbell Allen, one of my very favorite authors in the whole wide world. Hi, everyone. Hi. I want to know. <laughs> I want to read your bio. There are so many to ask you about this biography here. Nancy okay. Campbell Allen is the award-winning author of 20 published novels and several novellas. Is that still accurate? 20 published novels? It's closer to 24 now, I think. So I need to update yeah, the bio. I was going to say, I, I think it has to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, that's why not, not why I read it. I just wonder how many um, novels you've published, which encompass a variety of genres ranging from contemporary romantic suspense to historical fiction. Her most include Regency, Victorian, and steampunk romance are published through Shadow Mountain's Proper Romance line, and the What Happens in Venice novella series is part of the Thomas Anthology collection published by Mirror Press. Nancy writes contemporary romances under the pseudonym, pseudonym Lainey Bell, which I had no idea you had a pseudonym. That's awesome. And That's enjoy a brand new thing. Stories. Is it really? How long have you been doing that? Like just a couple months. So really new. Wow. That Yeah, that's awesome. It's a yeah. fictional Rocky Mountain ski valley similar to her own hometown. I am going to look for those. Her formal schooling includes a BS in elementary education from Weber State University, and she has worked as a ghost writer and freelance editor contributing to the re 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 let me start over, contributing to the releases Who Knew Howard Hughes by Jim Wetton and My Life Encapsulated by Kenneth Brailsford. How long have you been ghost writing? Was that just something you did a while um, back? That is something, hang on one second, I'm trying to get my, just make sure that my my interruptions are all turned off now. Okay, so we don't have any dinging on my end. Um, I, it's been a little while. I It was kind of back when I was doing um, uh, editing right alongside my own writing, and I just had a couple really great opportunities, The um, especially the um, uh, Jim Wetton, that, that book was amazing. That His experiences were just incredible, talking to him about Howard Hughes. And I mean, it was just, it was a once in a lifetime kind of an opportunity. And so I loved, I really loved that. That was fun. Oh, that sounds fun. All right. Nancy loves to read, write, travel, and research and enjoys spending time with family and friends. She nurtures a current obsession for true crime podcasts and is a news junkie. She and her husband have three children. She lives in Ogden with her family, one very large Siberian husky named Thor, an obnoxious but enduring Yorkie poo named, is it Freya? Freya. <laughs> is you print Freya? Yes. And you still have both yep. of those? Yes. Oh, awesome. Thor, I'm afraid probably not much too much longer for Thor, but, but for now we still have them both. So. Well, what's your favorite true crime pro podcast? You have a favorite one, or you just have a few that you listen to? There's a couple, but I I started out with um, Crime Junkies, and then kind of fell into this whole world. I had no idea that there was this whole world of you know true crime podcasts. Um, but one of my favorites has been um, um, there's Astonishing Legends, and that kind of is like with the out there stories. That's almost like an X Files kind of a mm. kind of a podcast which is fantastic and then the, um, there's another one and of course my mind's blanking oh most notorious and he takes kind of a look at historical um true crime stories and usually we'll interview like an author who has just released a, a new book about a certain event in history and it is fascinating and so much fun i just i just really enjoy it and then there's dateline you know all the old Sorry. all the old favorites yeah so I yeah. know. Does, does it spark story ideas for you? Definitely. Um, I most often, more often than not, my books end up having an element of mystery. Uh, there's usually some kind of crime and plot along those lines, and so uh, I get I get lots of ideas from from listening to <laughs> real life awful things. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I love about your books is the, I mean, the mystery element just keeps me turning pages because I have to see who the villain is. You know, you do such a good job with all the red herrings. I love Thank that. Thank you. Thanks. Mara. Hi, Mara. Mara is saying hi, Julia, Nancy. Hi, Mara. 
All right. I have to ask you, so you've written several genres. I mean, when you start out with like the Civil War, a little bit of time travel. I mean, I loved all of those. You've done Regency, Contemporary, you've done Steampunk, Proper Romance, Victorian. Do you have a favorite genre that you write? Um, I'm really liking Victorian. Uh, maybe it's because I'm I'm doing it right now. Um, but the, it's such a fun, especially late Victorian. Um, and, and that kind of dovetails with steampunk because that's also tends to be kind of a late Victorian look. And I just like it because you still have kind of the, the fun, maybe fictional glow of history. It wasn't, you know, nearly as rosy as we like to think it was, but right. also, especially at like the turn of the century, everything was so inventive and, and um, things were happening and things were possible and education had opened up for women. And I mean, it was a far cry, obviously, from where it needed to be for marginalized people, but we were getting there. It was like a step in the right direction. And so I just, I think it's just kind of a fun, it's, it, I don't know. Um, I liked writing Regency and I liked that era. And I also liked doing the Civil War series, which was like, you know, mid 1800s but um the, yeah the closer we get to the to the 1900s these days the more fun i have with it so yeah emily's on hi hi emily i have to ask you are you gonna do any more steampunk i am i am definitely doing, going to do more steampunk um the fourth in that series was my cinderella story um brass carriages and glass hearts and i kind of left a little bit of an opening for uh, two of my characters that I've really been wanting to to get going on their story. And so I have kind of some ideas brainstormed out and everything, um, but we just don't have a publication date scheduled yet. So we'll see how that goes. But one way or another, um, through one channel or another, eventually that book will see the light of day and it will be my my nod to The Little Mermaid. So I'm excited. Yay. It's so funny because when, when I first heard you were writing steampunk, I'm like, oh... I don't know what that is. I don't know if I want to read that. That sounds weird. <laughs> and then I like, and it is. Oh, my favorite author. I'll give it a try. And I loved it. I loved your stories. And they're so cool. And I felt like young and maybe hip reading. It's like, oh, I'm reading a steampunk, you know, to yeah, all my yeah. little younger friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we're cool again. That's right. That's yeah, right. It's I'm so glad there's more coming. Yeah. And now how too. many are planned in your proper romance line? How many are planned for this? Um series? Okay, so for there's the proper romance steampunks and um there's four of those hopefully potentially more. Um the the uh the first two that I did well, ish. I mean, there the publication dates were staggered, but it doesn't matter. Um, I have two Regency set books for the Proper Romance line, and then I am on the third of three Victorians for Proper Romance. So, um, even though they, I mean, they're all under the Proper Romance line and the Proper Romance title and and all that. Um, even though I, there's like three different time, three different things. There's a Regency, Steampunk, and Victorians within that within that line. So um, at least for now, for the Victorians that I'm doing right now, there's three with a possibility of four more um, in my, uh, in to capture his heart. Uh, Nathan has four sisters and I was of course, you know, getting into that, that story. I was like, Oh, I think these girls need their own stories too. So that tends to be how I work. <laughs> yeah. I would love to see all of their stories. They were fun. So, right. So there could be more, but right now it's definitely three for the Victorians. Yes. Yes. And you're three, working on the third one now. seven. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Getting the third one finished and ready to turn in. And um, uh, let's see. And I'm also working on, I, I'm working on a mystery, uh, which is still kind of, we haven't really announced what that's going to be yet um but hopefully we'll be looking at that sometime next year and that's also with shadow mountain so nice yeah that's all good news for all for your fans that's such good news for me <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, let's get into to capture his heart. Now, the first okay. thing I want to ask you about is Eva's profession as a photographer is so intriguing and you go into so much detail and it just felt so you know, real that you, you're doing this along with her. I'm assuming you had to do a ton of research for that. I did. And I started um, just, you know, looking for articles and books online about the process. And then as I was kind of Googling a little bit more, um, I came across some YouTube videos and people who still actually do that process with all of the old equipment. And it was so fascinating and so cool. And I was grateful to find the videos because I mean, you know, you can read about it and everything, but to actually see the process was fascinating. And there's something really cool about a dark room anyway. And that process of I took photography in high school, and it was just the most, you know, you got your negative and you run it through all the solutions and stuff. And then you project that image onto the paper and you see it come to life. And it's just it's it must have seemed like magic to them at the time as well in the early days of photography. It must have just been like the most amazing thing. And and the process, I mean, it was so much work. It was really, it's really cool to watch and exhausting to even think about. I mean, now I, you know, we flip up our phone and click and there you go. But yeah. um, it was it was an effort. <laughs> Well, I thought it was interesting. Now, it kind of seemed like in the book that she was making copies of pictures for the mm -hmm. people at the house party. How how did that process even work? Because I was really surprised when I read it going, could they even do that back then? They did because what they would the tr part of the treatment was they would have these photography plates and there was a solution that they would be, you know, they would do the solution kind of a dunking thing, put it in the camera. And they had about 15 minutes from the time they treated the plate to the time they got into the camera and exposed the, the photograph. So they would take it back out and keep it still in a, in, in its sleeve. And then it went through one more process um, of, uh, you know, like a, another chemical solution before it became a negative. And so then once that was there, it was, they had the, they had the, the negative forever unless they lost it or, or it was exposed mm. to light before they could get it through the final treatment. So it's just like it is now. Once you've got the negative, you can make as many copies of the picture as you want. So wow, that's pretty amazing. cool. Yeah. It would, it would seem like a pretty expensive thing though. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be pretty expensive back then to do photography? I think so. And I think once you had the equipment, I think that was probably the initial uh, the initial startup, but but also um, you have all the expense of having a dark room and, and maintaining the whole process. So, yeah, I think it wouldn't have been something that I mean, it would have been probably a luxury to be able to do it. Um, but also around the same time as when Eastman Kodak um, came up with their I, maybe it was just Kodak at the time. I can't remember now, but it was you take a hundred pictures on this roll of film and send the whole camera to this place in New York and then they would send you back um, mm -hmm. pictures and your camera that had been loaded up with film again. So people did have the option of kind of taking their own, but their own pictures, but again, kind of, it's just like now, you know how we take our own pictures, but then every now and then we have a professional do them. And I think that that was kind of how things were back then at the dawning of, yeah, yeah. of pictures. Right. Well, I thought it was so interesting that you made her, I mean, a woman photographer for one, especially in that time period, because that would have been, you know, pretty rare, I would think. And then also the crime scene photography that she did made her right. extra. It just gives her such a depth and, and she was such an interesting character. So, you know, well-rounded and real feeling. I mean, how do you, I guess you would have to do a lot of research as well because women's roles were so they're changing and they were evolving so quickly right around that time period. Right. And there were um, used to be in the old, 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 you know, mid Victorian times or whatever, a shop girl was also considered someone who also maybe had a, like a prostitution uh, job on the side. And so it went from being something that was considered quite negative and risque to being something that was morphing into something more um, respectable. And so a girl could actually have a job in the city and, and um, things, it, one of the reasons that I like Jane Eyre so much, um, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre is because she was, of course, that came out like 1830 ish. I can't, I can't remember the exact year. Um, but she was saying things that I think a lot of women were thinking. And one of the things that I love that she says in her book is that um, people don't basically, you know, loosely translated, people don't blink if a young man wants to broaden his horizons and see the world. And so why should we expect that a girl would be anything different? 
And that was something that really wasn't verbalized a lot, but I think a lot of women felt. And so when the opportunity did come to be able to go to school and, and kind of have a career with the understanding that you would probably not be doing it much beyond marriage, if, if at all, um, it was still, it was, it was still options that so many, so many women didn't have. Um, and one of the things that I loved about giving Ava <laughs> a job as a photographer, one is because, I mean, you could do that and still be considered a respectable young woman. Um, but then having her do crime scenes also was something that I got a kick out of because I also kind of created her as this very genteel, diplomatic, um, mm -hmm. very ladylike woman. Um, and so to think of her standing there in a, in a, you know, in a crime scene, it was such this perfect juxtaposition yeah. in the way that she was able to turn off and, you know, turn off the, the squeamish part and just be down to business and get things done and be professional. Um, that was a really fun, I don't know, kind of a balance to do with her. Yeah. So. And I love how you wrote the reactions when people found out about, you know, the crime scene things and, you know, even the Denise thing, how much he admired that about her. And it was, it was such a surprising thing. Yeah. And All right, was, I have and to of course ask you, I'll go no, I was just going to say that, um, of course, crime scene photography and all those, you know, forensics and everything that we know so well now was just in its infancy. I mean, if even and I think that um, I I may have pushed the envelope just a little bit um, with her actually, you know, setting up her equipment. They, they did have people were taking pictures of crime scenes then, um, but it was barely, I think, you know, coming into its own. So. <coughs> Excuse me. So I love the chemistry between her and Nathan. And I have to ask you, so the, one of the scenes that really stuck out to me was the cave scene where they find the body. Spoiler alert for those of you who haven't read it, but where she's being, she's being tough. She's, you know, strong. And yet Nathan still feels so protective about her. And it was just such a great chemistry moment between them. So I was wondering, do you have a favorite moment between them that you've written for them, for Nathan and I'm, I guess Ava. I've been saying Eva, but I guess it's Ava. Oh yeah, either way. I think in my head I always just kind of heard Ava, but either way because her name is Evangeline, so it would be Eva. Um, I really like. I do like that scene, and I know what you mean. That was a fun one because she's she, she's not um, she's not worried about trying to be tough with him. Um, she's not worried about trying to show him I can be brave and everything. She's willing to kind of, you know, lean on his shoulder. Um, yeah. but I think I really enjoyed the, um, the maze scene, the, the labyrinth scene when they've had their very oh. first, I think that's their first great kiss. And, yeah. um, and then the scene a little bit after that, when they've realized, oh, this is a real thing and we're going to enjoy this and we don't have to pretend anymore. Um, and then they have a great interaction that his sisters actually kind of catch and walk in on in the hallway. And that was really, that was a fun one to write just that because really his good. sisters were funny. And so, yeah. Yeah. His sisters are really funny. Well, and it was such a great, I mean, they both had such a, you know, kind of a wounded heart and were so unsure of the other person and the back and forth. It was so good. You did such a great job with the chemistry and they're just Thank such a you. great couple. It was really one of my most favorite books this year. For Thanks. sure. Thank you. Crystal has joined us and she said she loved that about Ava as well. Oh, so cool. you, you just caught all of us in your web of romance and intrigue. <laughs> so you've written a lot of characters. Like, I mean, you have a lot of strong women. I mean, even going back mm -hmm. to like Isabel Webb and the Pinkerton spies. And, you know, there was one scene in a book you wrote. I, I think it's No Time for Love. And they're sitting around, the couple is sitting around a fire and it's time travel. And they're talking about um, her sins. And he kind of laughingly says, you know, returning your video late to Blockbuster doesn't count. And it's <laughs> to me that I can remember that all these years later, because that must have been, what, 15 years ago? Was that your first book? It was 1999. So what oh is that? That's a lot. I know. I know. That's how long it's been and how fast it's gone. And the fact that it, that's one lesson that I learned about writing and about trying not to date yourself <laughs> because <laughs> nobody returns videos to Blockbuster anymore. And what was funny is that I remember that I had that um, idea sparked from something I had seen or read where it said the character was saying, 
you're not as bad as you think you are. Overdue library books don't count. And so I remember thinking, oh, haha, that would be funny to do it with, you know, videos from Blockbuster. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that really, it really dates it. So yeah, what is that? 1999 to, uh, yeah, 23 to yeah, 23. Well, it's yeah. funny to me that line has stuck out to me all these years for one because I laughed so hard when I read it <laughs> and that it's 23 years ago that's crazy it but is. my question my question is do you have a favorite couple that you've written of all of the books you've written do you have a favorite couple that you just would love to go back to maybe sometime or one that you just really loved writing oh gosh um, I ask the questions <laughs> um, I really liked Daniel Pickett and Isla Cooper in um, Kiss of the Spindle. They were really fun. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what it was about those two that just was like a fun little chemistry. Um, yeah. And maybe it's because they kind of I reminded really me of Elizabeth. Yes, I think that's probably it. Um, and they reminded me a little bit. It felt familiar to how I had been with Isabel and James in my Isabel web series. Um, they were a really good, solid couple. Once they admitted how they felt, then um, they had their ups and downs and, and whatever, whatever, but uh, they were, they were solid and um, they kind of grew together and they grew to love each other and appreciate each other, even, even through hard or frustrating times or whatever. Um, and I, maybe it's because Isabel was with me for so long um, I had written her in the Civil War series first, and that came out in 2001, I think. Um, mm. And so there were four years of that Civil War series that she was in those books. And then because the research had been so painfully hard and kind of depressing, you know, um, I really wanted kind of a break. And so I decided Isabel was going to be like a, you know, a, an Indiana Jones girl. And so took her on some adventures. So overall, by the time I finished with that series, um, she had been with me for like 12 years. I had been actively writing her into stories for about 12 years, I think it was. And so she's always kind of in the back of my mind as kind of my, my girl, my, my favorite. So, yeah. yeah. So she, I don't know. Um, I loved her. Yes. I loved all of those Thanks. characters. I couldn't pick a favorite. I was trying to think how I would answer that question. I, I just couldn't pick a favorite. You do so good. I know. I was going to say, I'm going to flip that around and ask you. That's a tough one. <laughs> That is a tough one for sure. Yeah. Can't pick your favorite baby. Nope. Nope. And um, I was going to say, and to capture his heart, you have that seaside setting that's so beautiful and so real. Is that a real place that you've been to that you kind of fictionalized or has, is it all just fictional from your imagination? It's fictional from my imagination and from um, videos, um, old Victorian seaside postcards and things like that, that I would use to kind of get a good visual um, and just research about different seaside towns in England. But I kind of wanted to, I didn't want to make it an actual place that I haven't been to and then mess it up. And so I thought, well, if I fictionalize it, at least I can kind of, I can kind of mess with it a little bit. And so that's why I did that. But yeah, someday I would like to go and, and visit seaside England. So I know. When was the last time you went on a research trip? Has it been a little while? It's been a while. Um, it's been a long time. Yeah. I uh, probably since Civil War days. And uh, yeah. So, I mean, most of my research has been stuff online and videos and um, yeah. And my, my imagination. <laughs> I know. I would love to travel again. COVID just messed everything up for everyone. It's it really did. Days. Oh, yeah. luck gets busy, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell me what you're working on now. Can you give us like a little hint or a little sneak peek on what, what you're writing now? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, finishing up the third in the Victorian series, which is Charlotte's story. And that's really been fun. That's a lot of fun. Um, and that's also one that's kind of loosely based on... Um, I was brainstorming with my friend, Josie Kilpack. She's a, you who you know well. And um, she had also been listening to a true crime podcast and I was kind of looking for ideas and she said, well, and she happened to mention one that I had also listened to and I'm like, that's it. That's perfect. And so, uh, so that's been a fun, fun, I don't know, fun finish to that, that trio of cousins. 
Um, and then I am working on a mystery that's a contemporary mystery uh, for Shadow Mountain. Um, no firm release date yet, um, but getting there. And um, and then with my contemporary stuff, I'm doing under the my pen name, Lainey Bell. I just wanted to do something a little bit different. They're like a little bit, they're not novellas. I would say they're longer than novellas, but shorter than some of the other stuff that I write. And um, I kind of wanted to dip my feet back into the contemporary arena again, just because it had been so long. And, yeah. um, and I wanted a way to kind of differentiate that from my historical stuff. And so, and the reason I chose that pen name is because my middle name is Elaine. And my mom used to call me Lainey, Nancy Lainey. And so I went with Lainey Bell because Bell is, you know, just the last part of my maiden name, Campbell. Um, so that I just, you know, decided to have some fun with it and set it in this little Rocky Mountain ski town. And it's fun. And one of the things that I've enjoyed so much about that is how quickly it writes itself. Um, when I'm not worried about whether or not they're saying the right thing or a period appropriate thing <laughs> or using the wrong word for the wrong era, um, I found that it it goes much more quickly. And so that's been a lot of fun. How many Laney Bell books are there? There's only one right now, but there will be four um, in that series. And I'm, I'm debating whether or not to expand that or to kind of start with another town and do another little little contemporary series. So we'll see. When did it come out? I'm just so amazed that I have missed that you had a pen name. Um, I'm going to go look for all of the Laney Bells. <laughs> you know, I, it's been, because I've had other projects going on at the same time, um, one of the books that was supposed to have come out by now was pushed back. So um, I only did, let's see, I started, I want to say September was when the first one came out and it's called um, Sugar Rush. And uh, I did it kind of like a soft release. I didn't do any, I didn't hit it hard with any real big advertising or anything. I just wanted to, because it was something that was so out of the norm for what I've been doing for years, I wanted to, to get it out there and just have it be a thing that was done, um, even though I hadn't done a big, huge advertising push or anything. And so I figure with the next one that comes out with that series, um, hopefully the next couple months, then I will start to kind of hit the advertising and, and, you know, a lot of that other stuff to make it a little more visible. And so it's not just this weird hidden thing. <laughs> right. Well, who's your publisher for that? That's just me. I'm just doing those all on my, all on my own. Oh, so, nice. So, yeah. Um, somebody's fun. asking, will Sugar Rush be in paperback? It will be. Other people have asked me that too. I'm waiting on my, the, I have a woman who does my covers and she's fantastic. She lives in Australia and she's very, 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 very sought after. And what I'm waiting on is to, there's different formatting for a Kindle book versus a paperback. And you have to have uh, a different file format for the cover for a paperback. So I'm just waiting on that. And then once I get that, then it will be available and you can order it um, in paperback. So one of those, you don't have, you know, process things. Um, I would like to see it by the end of December. Hopefully the paperback up and available. So we'll see. I hope. And the second book may be by February. Probably by end of January, February is my, is my plan. So yeah, February is probably a safer, a safer bet. So. I am so excited that I have more Nancy Campbell Ellen to read. Lainey oh, Bell. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Mar didn't know. Doesn't know. So we can help spread the word. Nancy Campbell Ellen, Lainey Bell. Thank you. And one <laughs> thing I don't know if anyone else is aware of is a lot of your books are 99 cents right now, your Kindle books. So like all your steampunks are 99 cents and a ton of them are. So it's the best time to get into Nancy Campbell Ellen books. It's true. They are. If they're not no, are they 99 right now? I need to look again. Um, when I looked right before we got on, they still were. Okay, good. Um, because I, I <laughs> not too long ago, I said on Instagram, they're 99 cents. And then someone said, they're $1.99. It's not 99 cents. And so, you know, I had to make that correction. But either way, I mean, for, you know, I spend more on a soda. So <laughs> that's what I always I know, think when right? I... When I think, do I want to buy another book for my Kindle? I'm like, well, you know what? I spend, I spend more on my swig than I do <laughs> <laughs> on oh, books it's sometimes. It's so yeah, it's a pretty good deal. My to read list is getting so big these days, but I have to have my favorite authors bump to the top. 
can't can't miss anything you know it's hard like sarah yeah. i'm reading sarah eden's new one um, best the best intentions right now and and yes. loving that she's my and auto, she's always, auto to the top yep i was gonna say she's always got one coming right around the corner so she's she'll stay up at the top of your of your list for sure Yep, she's so good. Well, I read them so fast, they're so good. But she, I don't know how she publishes as quickly as she does. It is amazing to me. I don't know. She's got magic words, magic, magic words. She truly does. What are you reading these days? Oh, what am I reading? Um, I am reading. Oh, now that my mind's gone blank. <laughs> um, it's by and now I can't Maria. Marie Yovanovitch. She was the ambassador to Ukraine uh, a couple years ago. Anyway, I'm reading her biography. And then also I am reading, um, oh, what's it called? A Court of Thorns and Roses series. It's the young adult series that that so many people have been like, this series is so great. And I started it and I'm like, you know, and then yeah. next thing I know, I'm just page after page it's a page turner she tells a really good story and so i'm in the middle of that series and just kind of you know yeah, enjoying that? I don't the think I've heard of that. um sarah j mass m-a-s-s -S, and no m-a-a-s oh. and um she i mean a little bit of a content warning there as the as the series progresses it gets a little more explicit and so i think it starts more as a young adult series and then moves into more of an adult content series um even given that, I um, I just I really enjoyed it. She's a some people can just tell a really good story, and she's built an amazing yeah. world with that. It's really been fun. So, is your favorite genre to read more mystery YA, or what's your favorite genre? I tend to like mystery with romance or romance with mystery, um, and I also really do oh. like I like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shocker. Um, I like, and the, the fiction podcasts that I've liked to listen to also lately, other than just the true crime are also like the sci-fi, the big like space dramas and stuff like that, that you find on different, on various podcasting platforms. And they're so much fun. And I've often thought yeah. maybe I would like to try to write something like that, but then I just, I don't know if I, maybe that's something that I'm just going to enjoy consuming rather than trying to reproduce just because people are so talented and the world building is amazing to me. And so I'm really kind of enjoying the, the wow. lighter hand of fantasy sci-fi and, you know, anything with a romance and a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. Those are really good. They just pull me in, suck me in. I, I especially know I cannot start an Nancy Campbell Allen book before bed because then I will stay up all night and it will be terrible the next day. So I have learned <laughs> just warning for others out there. Don't start it at bedtime. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure you always listen to the authors off the page podcast as well, right? You listen to of my course. podcast every now and then. Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ours is definitely not a time, but we do laugh a lot. I, yes. You, I'm you laughing know, is good. It's I we're, do. We're it's been a little bit, but yes. <laughs> oh, crazy. All right. I want to yeah. ask you, what is your writing process? Do you have a critique group? Do you, are you, what's your writing process? Um, I do. I, I'm a plotter. I do a lot of brainstorming and plotting and outlining. And I use, I have a couple of critique partners, um, Jen, Jenny Moore, Jennifer Moore and Josie Kilpack and uh, Becca Wilhite have been people that I, um, especially lately, have been, the four of us have just formed a really good rhythm in um, talking and brainstorming. And then once we finish a project with swapping and, and getting some feedback and, and beta reads and that sort of thing before we turn in a project. And so um, I kind of hash it out on my own um, and then get feedback from them and then turn it in and keep my fingers crossed and <laughs> hope that my editor likes it. Um, yeah. But I, I really enjoy, I enjoy the whole process. I really like, I like brainstorming. I like, that's probably my favorite part because the story's perfect still. It's absolutely yeah. perfect when it's still in its planning stages. Yeah. Um, and it'll never be as perfect 
you know, when it comes out as it is in that at that moment. But it's such a fun discovery time that I really find myself enjoying that that whole piece of the process. Are you a revise as you go kind of author or do you just draft it and then go back and revise? I try to, I tell myself that I need to just draft and then uh, not pause and go back and fish, finish or fix anything because you can, you know, kind of gut through a first draft if you'll just go. But yeah. lately I find that I will write and then I will like the next day I'm, I'll review what I wrote before and kind of clean that up and then start with the fresh days stuff. Um, so I kind of do it as I go, but then other times there's stuff that you just don't see until you get to the end and realize, oh, I've got to go back and fix that. And then that changes this, changes this, changes this, you know. So right. I, yeah, I do tend to kind of try to try to do it as I go. And sometimes that works. So do you have a writing schedule that you write a certain amount of time or words every day? Um, I try with lately with juggling projects and stuff, I've tried to do like 1500 words a day in each project that doesn't always happen. Um, and I, it's not for lack of time. I do have time during the day, but I do find that if I'm not careful, it gets eaten up by lots of things. And wow. I tend to, I can average about my average tends to be about a thousand words an hour. Um, I have friends who do more. I have friends who do less. And somehow we all we all manage to, you know, I, and you would agree, I'm sure we, we find our rhythm and we manage to make it work. Um, yeah. And so I know that if I've written a 70,000 word book that it took me, you know, 70 hours to to get there. So um, yeah. usually I try to, you know, like four, at least four hours a day is what I try to do just for drafting alone. Um, wow. And social media, I am so far behind on I just um I'm learning I'm learning I'm getting there <laughs> so let me see if I get this straight so you work on multiple projects and you just do different days for multiple projects um I kind of was debating on how I wanted to do that when I when I decided I was going to do Laney Bell stuff and then I also was approached to do a couple anthologies for different projects and and I have found that like I I've really enjoyed um, spending morning hours on one project and then afternoon hours on another and kind of doing it back to back. That's really worked for me. Um, I tend to really bulk at routine, which is really what a, a successful writer needs to really master <laughs> is a good routine. Yeah. And so kind of juggling projects and working on both during the same, in the same day has been really good. But, and then I also know what, with um, due dates and stuff, I know how many, excuse me, I know what needs, if, for example, if I know that this deadline is coming up, I'm going to have to work more on this particular project and set the other one aside for a little bit, you know, so uh, typically, but typically it's every day. Yeah. Wow. Do you work holidays and weekends or you leave those? I try to, <laughs> <laughs> when I go through my calendar and I map out what needs to be done and when I always blast right through the weekends too. And then more often than not, I'm like, I can hear people having fun downstairs and I'm up in my office and this is no good. <laughs> so I know that the family's having fun without me and I end up running downstairs and not getting my stuff done. And so then I throw off my whole schedule, but, um, I, I love do, that you try, have but I do, yeah, <laughs> I do have a schedule. Um, I do even, even on weekends and holidays, I really think there's something to be said for the habit of just getting something down, whether it's, you know, productive or just an exercise or, or a journal or just something just to kind of keep, keep it fresh and keep it moving. If you put it aside for too long, I have found for me anyway, um, you lose it. You lose the, yeah. the threads yeah. and yeah. That's so true. So, how about you? Do you do weekends? No, <laughs> no, I it's don't. hard. Yeah really hard especially yeah, when you have a lot of family and a lot of responsibilities as a wife and a mom and you know, yep. yep but i have a sprint group but during the week that i that helps me a lot to push myself and get things done isn't that great <laughs> i i really like that do you Thank sprint you. like do you have like certain times or do you zoom or do you just yeah they have a zoom link so nice um, it's nice to check in we check in every like 45 minutes or whatever and then go again and yep it's just, I just sometimes need that little extra push when I'm not truly motivated to sit down and write. I don't know if you ever get Absolutely. that way. Oh, every day. 
every day. (laughs) I can think of a dozen things I would rather be doing. (laughs) It's not easy. It's a hard thing. And you also know that you're going to do a deep dive into it. You know, you're, it's like a, you have to go somewhere in your head to make it work and make it flow. Yeah. I really had to stop comparing my, I can't compare myself to other authors because it, for me, it's like, oh man, I wish I could get out, you know, 10 books a year or whatever that other author's done. And I just have to be more careful with myself and, you know, I'm doing what I can do and, and be happy with that. It's really, this whole year has taught me about patience with myself. I bet. Yep. Patience and priorities and yeah, self-love. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I am so, so excited to learn about Lainey Bell. I'm going to go and buy that right away <laughs> as soon as we Thank get done. You. Thank so, you. I'm so happy you have a pen name. That is awesome. That's and fun. contemporary it's fun. is like so different for you. That must have been so crazy going back to contemporary because like you said, you haven't done it forever. Yeah. 20, 20 years. Yep. It really was crazy. And not only that, but I decided I wanted to do it um, first person present tense, which is uh, much oh. more modern kind of way of telling a story and so I thought I'm just gonna I'm gonna try this and see how it works and it just it was just really fun so yeah and so like how many pages would you say it's more than a novella but less than a novel so how many pages um, are we talking? so well, about 50,000 words so, so 150 a- pages 130 pages ish Really? I was thinking more like 150 I think, pages, but I it's think, like the perfect you're, I think you're holiday right. book. Yes. When you don't have a lot of time, you can just right. get it out and get it read. That's yep. awesome. Yep. Thanks. Oh, well, I'm so excited you could join me today. And you're always so fun to have on and catch up with. I've missed chatting with author friends. I haven't seen anybody forever, it seems like. I know. We used to at least be able to count on seeing each other like at signings and things and conferences and stuff. It's been a long time. So, but I appreciate you asking me and I'm honored and, and just flattered and always just kind of delighted to find out that people are actually reading my stuff. It's a, it really is a genuine honor and I, and I enjoy it. Oh, to capture my heart or to capture his heart was seriously one of my favorite books of the year. I loved it. Can't wait for the next one in the series for sure. And I really hope that people will go out, I mean, where your books are on sale, 99 cents, to go try a Nancy Campbell Allen book maybe that you haven't tried yet. So it's the perfect time to do yeah. it. Or buy a gift thank for you, someone. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. It's a nice cheap gift. Cheaper than a soda. <laughs> Cheap. <laughs> That's right. Does anyone else have any questions before we sign off? Mar and Krista love authors off the page. Thank you, ladies. Any other questions for Nancy tonight? Heart emojis. Everyone has heart emojis for you. Oh, Mara's going to show Thanks, you guys. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're the best. And thank you so much for coming. And Oh, and go read the review thanks, of um, the Capture His Heart in Reading Magazine. Of course, it was a little bit of a gushing review because I loved it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Crystal wanted to know if you have a street team. I don't yet. And I do have a group on uh, Facebook called Miss Nancy's Bookish Friends. And I had intended to uh, build my street team from there. And I just have completely, completely neglected that page. So this will be a good motivation for me to get back over there and kind of get that going again, because we started to build a little bit of a community. And then I just was completely AWOL. So um, yeah, so so maybe with Miss Nancy's Bookish Friends, I can start building my street team. Yeah, uh, Chris wants I want to join. <laughs> nice. Might as well get all the people who hey. love your book. Spread the word, right? Right. Yeah, that's a that's a really nice bonus. Mara says she knows some people that will join. All your fans. Oh, good. Sweet. Awesome. Any other questions, okay. ladies? All right. Well, thanks again. I appreciate everyone you nancy you're the best thanks julie thank you so much for for making time for me and space for me and for always being so so gracious oh i appreciate you all right well we'll see you next month for our book chat book club thank you